also mention that, you know, this conversation is a part of a larger body of conversations that we've been having online called the Left of Center Conversations. And very quickly, Left of Center is a two-year artist incubator that supports the careers of emerging Black artists and kind of meets them where they're at. So we've got everything from creative consulting, artist conversations, and then seed funding later on in 2021. Um, and so if you go to our YouTube channel, and I'll actually put it in the uh, chat after this, um, you'll see a series of six conversations that we've had with people just as amazing as Leah Simone uh, on, you know, discussing everything from press, some more information about grants, uh, artist contracts, invoices, um, you know, understanding who you are, artist bios. We've kind of like covered uh, a very wide uh, range of topics that often emerging Black artists will be grappling with and, um, you know, trying to uh, get a better sense of how to uh, advance their careers. So after like you're soaking in all of Leah Simone's amazing info, you can go in and soak in more info on YouTube. And I'll put the link for that down below. Um, but yeah, let's just get started. I would love to open with a land acknowledgement, which can be odd in these times, given that we're all sitting here virtual, um, but we are sitting somewhere. And so I know for myself, I am currently out of uh, Toronto, Ontario, very specifically Scarborough. If anyone knows about Scarborough, you know, my heart goes out to you. It's a great place. Um, but you know, we must acknowledge and give thanks to the Hurong Wendat Nation, Métis Nation of Ontario, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Mississaugas of the Skugok Island, First Nation, and Six Nations of the Grand River as traditional inhabitants of the lands of the City of Toronto, where we stand on the bones of Indigenous peoples of this land. We also acknowledge all treaty peoples, including those who came here as settlers, as migrants either in this generation or in generations past, and those of us who came here involuntarily, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. Today we pay tribute to the ancestors of those of African origin and descent as well. So I'm, you know, so humble and so happy to be here. Very thankful. I know the very difficult times that we're in, but I hope you're able to take this information and really support, you know, funding your dreams and getting your dreams off the ground. I've been speaking for a lot, but I would love to introduce our amazing guest here on our screen. Uh, Leah Simone Bowen is the co-host and creator of the Irreverent History podcast, The Secret Life of Canada. So lucky to have you here, Leah Simone. Uh, debuting in August 2017, it rose to the top of the iTunes charts, amassed critical acclaim and millions of downloads. In 2019, it would become the first independently created podcast to be picked up by the CBC. She is also a writer, theater director, and the former artistic producer of Obsidian Theater, as well as a past theater program manager at the Toronto Arts Council. Leah is a graduate of the University of Toronto's theater program as well. Leah Simone, I think it's always great to have artists introduce themselves as well. Like your bio is amazing and beautiful, but yeah. in your very own immediate present words, who are you and how are you? That's a philosophical question, mm. actually. Um, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm good. I think actually my bio kind of covers everything. But yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, mostly a writer, um, theater person, and now a podcaster yeah. um, at the CBC. So yeah. Amazing. So we'll just jump right into the conversation. You know, we're here to talk about how to get your artistic projects funded, whether they're by, you know, an arts council, a funding body, a private donor, a friend, you know, it's really important, you know, when we're creating these artistic projects to figure out how we get them off the ground. And sometimes money is just like, you know, a really big part of that. So I wanted to talk about creation grants in particular to begin this. And so, you know, there's a wide range of grants that exist. We're talking community arts grants, you know, creation grants, professional development grants. What makes an artist creation grant different from other grants that folks might come into um, as they're developing their careers as artists? Well, a creation grant is really specific to the artist process. Usually it's about a, a single artist, like you'll, you'll probably be applying a loan for it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really about you as an artist, as opposed to other grants usually, not always, are... Um, usually center around a group project or maybe something with a, with a larger scope. So in theater, it could be just like a four hander play that then needs a designer and a, and a, um, you know, a director um, in visual arts. It could even be about getting funding for a gallery um, to pay salaries, that kind of stuff. Um, so th those are the main differences. Usually a creation grant is just for the artist. And so it's really about um, writing a grant and, and applying with your authentic voice. 
Right. I like to imagine that there is a creation grant for every artistic medium. You know, if you are a crafter, if you're a theater producer, if you're a singer songwriter, in my mind, there's a grant for that. Um, mm. How do you, how do you recommend people who are maybe in more niche artistic disciplines? Like I think when you think of visual arts um, or even things like dance and performance arts, it's very immediate to tie a grant program to that. Um, but for people who are working in more like discrete artistic disciplines, how can they figure out like which creation grant is right for them, especially when it comes to figuring out the medium of you know where to look for when you're working through a grant application? Well, the first thing people should know is that a lot of grants, even if they, they're a discipline, and discipline just basically means the kind of art. You'll hear people say, um, you know, discipline specific, that just means what kind of art. So theater, visual arts, dance, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think the thing that most people don't realize is that um, a lot of people who are successful in grant writing um, blur the line of their artistic practice. So they're uh, dancer singers, um, you know, visual artists and performance artists, um, theater makers and uh, visual artists. You, you get the idea. Take two things and put them together. So that's the first thing. And I think a lot of times, especially artists that are working in niche, like you say, like maybe um, crafts people, or maybe you're an artist that's, that works exclusively in libraries or, you know, with children or whatever, um, they, a lot of times will do themselves a disservice and not even try because they go, well, I'm looking at all these, these funding things and none of them say an artist who works with crafts, so I'm not going to apply. But you should know the first thing that you should really do is always ask. So the people that work at the councils, there's the Canada council, the major ones, mm -hmm. um, Ontario arts council and Toronto arts council here in um, Ontario. Anyway, their, their job is to answer your questions. Um, that's what I used to do. Uh, when I worked at the Toronto Arts Council, I worked in the theater program. That was my whole job. People would phone me and I would go, yeah, you can apply. Or actually, you know what? Call the visual arts person. Right. Um, so that is, it, it's, that is the first barrier that people put up. I would not say that it is a barrier, but people put it up a lot of times for themselves because they don't see it on the page and they go, well, it's not where I'm not going to try or right. it's not there. Yeah. Right. And very quickly, um, this information I think it's pretty um, easy to find, but I have been on some websites where I'm like, you know, looking for quite some time. How do you mm -hmm. find this person? You know, you're looking at applying for a specific grant or you've just got questions about it. How do you mm -hmm. find their contact info on the website or, you know, kind of anywhere else? Is a DM going to suffice? Is it an email? What does it look yeah, like? Yeah, definitely don't. Well, if you have their DM information, then maybe <laughs> you do know them. But um, yeah, an email or a phone call is best. Mm -hmm. Every website, every funder will have a contact us page. Sometimes you get onto that page and it's just like a catch-all email. Mm -hmm. Email that. If, if that's the only email they provide, email that. The mm -hmm. Toronto Arts Council does have a staff listing. So you open the staff listing and it will, it will show all the people that work there and what discipline they work in. That's how you contact them. Mm -hmm. The Canada Council, on the other hand, in my opinion... I'm sure they're lovely people, is a maze and somewhat incoherent, mm. I think, if you're a first time or even, you know, a 40th time like I am um, person applying for a grant, because now that there's no discipline, now that they, they don't divide um, the programs up by art, so there's no theater program, there's no visual arts, it's, um, they have different headings. So one will be like, um, I don't remember them all, but like one will be creation. Yeah. One research, will be like that. Yeah, research and stuff. And so sometimes it's not necessarily clear who you should be contacting. Right. And so what I would say to that is pick a person, mm -hmm. any person, probably not like the executive director, but just pick one of those people that calls themselves a, um, uh, either like a granting officer or a granting, you know, manager, email them and just say, I'm really unclear who I should contact, please. And that's their job. Right. So that's the other thing. You have to be a little bit bold. And I would just always remind people that don't be scared to contact mm. 
um, this group of people because that is their job to help you, the artist. The, the reason they have a job is because you're an artist and they're there to help you. So that's how to think about it. That's such a good way to think about it. Yeah. Um, reminding yourself that their job exists to support people like you in being successful in receiving funds. And so, yeah, reframing it that way, I imagine is really helpful. And we're going to get into some of the barriers that um, exist or the ways that grants can be designed sometimes, whether intentionally or inadvertently to, to be difficult and, um, you know, have a lot of barriers in front of them that definitely shouldn't exist there. Um, so I want to talk about when you have your idea, you've got like your baby, your project, and you're deciding that you're ready to take this forward. Or maybe you've already got a project that you've been working on. Maybe you've put it on the back burner or it just needs to go to that next step. But essentially, you've got something that needs some support. How do you know when you're ready to apply for funding? How do you know? Is it some kind of like internal awakening where you just wake up and you're like, aha, it's time? Or is there like, you know, a series of questions that you can kind of ask yourself to better understand, mm -hmm. yes, this project is ready to receive funding from X, Y, and Z body or person? Yeah, I think the simplest answer is you're ready to apply when you have all of the elements to put into a grant. And the, how you figure that out is on the websites um, of all of these places, they'll have um, grant guidelines. So it will say you'll need to have a bio, you'll need to have the names of the groups, uh, the name of the group of people that you want to work with. Uh, you'll need to have, you know, X, Y, and Z. Hmm. When you have all of that, you're ready to apply. And I think it's less about a feeling because I think, Another barrier that people give to themselves is that, well, I have all the things, but I, I'm, I don't have, um, you know, I haven't been an artist long enough, or I'm really unsure. I, I actually don't feel like I could compete with the group that's getting funding now. Like all of those, right. it's the stories that we tell ourselves as artists of like why um, it's not going to be successful. So right that's all you need is you, you need to have that material and the best way to get that material is just to start building it. You can work really hard on it and do it in, you know, a month or two, mm -hmm. or if it's something that you're building and it's a, a project that you're building, start putting that together slowly. Cause once you have that information, you can start applying to many different programs. Cause now you have it, you've got your little folder with all the bios and all the, work plans and whatever and it's just kind of a cut and paste right yeah we've been seeing that a lot with a lot of emerging uh black artists who maybe will have a project and they're like yeah i'm ready but i actually don't have any of the materials that are required to support the project at the funding level so now you've got the idea and you're beginning to build out your artist statement and your artist bio and your cv which can take a lot of time and sometimes you might miss the deadline so it's really mm -hmm. important to have those in play in a little folder somewhere so that you know deadlines they really you know, spring up on me at least. And I imagine yeah. they come up on a lot of people very quickly. And so being prepared and just having a little Rolodex of all your support materials. And like, you're right, going through the guidelines and just seeing what's going to be asked of you is uh, always important. And I know a lot of um, grant programs require you to create a profile as well. Would you recommend that folks just make that profile, even if they don't have a project that's ready? So again, they can begin to open the grants on the back end and see what they look like. You can. I mean, um, we actually have a question about the Canada Council. So I'm going to talk yeah. really briefly. I'm going to answer your question. Then I'm going to answer, I think it's Khadija. Khadija. Has, uh, yeah. um, and so we're going to answer that. And so yeah. I would say at the Canada Council, do everything when you're ready. Because yeah. at the Canada Council, they're, they're, and I, I'm pretty sure it's being looked at, but there was an approval process, right? You have to submit a proof profile and then they look at it and, and basically see if you um, fit the criteria of being a professional artist, mm -hmm. which it, now that I don't work in funding, I can say is really unfortunate and they shouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, and I think it is a huge barrier mm -hmm. and I think it's wrong because um, really, you know, I think the idea of who is a professional artist is quite an open definition. At the Toronto Arts Council, the definition is if your peers view you as a professional artist, and if you've been working, I think it's like one year out of school or two years out of school, which I think is a fair um, definition. You know, have some work. If you, if you went to school for that practice, you need to have a little bit of work under your belt to understand 
and also have peers that will say, oh yeah, I know that she's working on her right. art or whatever. Right. Okay. Um, the mm-hmm. question. And just to read the question, for folks. Yeah, um, I can read the question out loud, and then mm-hmm. there's a great feature where um, I can type out like La- Leah Simone's response as well. So if maybe you go and come back and you want to reference the answer, you can always find it here in this Q and A window. But I'll read the question out loud first. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kadisha writes, "I'm a BIPOC artist, and I had a disappointing experience with Canada Council, and I don't think they are there to support all diverse artists." All is in uh, air qu- uh, quotes. I attended their grant info session and they were very unattentive when I asked questions. And later when I emailed them, they didn't even respond. How do you troubleshoot that? That's a phenomenal question. Thank you so much. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. So uh, first of all, I would say I'm really sorry that you had that experience. And Mm -hmm. that's not actually, uh, you know, I've heard that before because the Canada Council, and I'm really not picking on them because there's some very good people that work at the Canada Council, but it is a huge, large organization with many departments. And I think often people get lost in the shuffle of that organization. So the first thing I would say is, um, you know, if, if the person that you were talking to did not answer your question, um, I would email and, and didn't answer your email. If it was the same person, I would email someone else and I would say who it was. I would, I would take the, the email that you sent and forward it to someone else and say, I've had this question. I, I, I attended an info session, which is great that you did that. That shows that you're taking the initiative and just say, no one has answered my question. How do I get someone to answer my question mm-hmm. and make sure that you, you forward that initial email. Um, because I feel like shame sometimes can really help us get to our goals. Um, but I, I also think it's important that, you know, you keep trying because this could just be a person who, who knows, I'm not going to try and figure out why they did that, but I would just try someone else. And if that still doesn't work, then figure out who the executives, like who the higher ups and, and, um, email them. Also, I find with this kind of stuff, to be honest, when I was uh, working as a program manager, I got so many emails. I can't tell you so many emails. And it's possible that I missed a, a few because I'm a human being. But what I almost never missed was phone calls. People would leave me voicemails and I would answer them. I don't know why, but sometimes just picking up the phone um, can be a faster way to that person because you've got them right there. So hopefully that helps. And I'm, I'm sorry that you had to go through that or still go through that. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. And this is a great reminder. If folks have questions, you know, they can always come in. I'm seeing one more. Um, oh, it's just a response from Khadija. Thanks for that assertive attitude. And but as you know, artists are quite sensitive. I would agree. Yeah. They can be quite sensitive. Yes. Yeah. And it feels personal, right? It feels like, oh, they don't want to answer my question. They don't want to support my art. My art is me. You know, all is lost. I, I, I completely understand that as well. But it's not true. And it's just one person, probably one overworked person at the Canada Council who, you know, should be yeah. should be better <laughs> it's a good exercise in being assertive though just you know following up on those emails following up even if you haven't heard back like sometimes will be a stated you know artists will hear back in like six to eight four to eight months whatever that may be and maybe it's been a while and you haven't heard back like you know it's always important mm-hmm. to follow up and just take that um sense of ownership over your application once it's submitted you know it's not just gone into the either but something that you can uh follow up on once your email's gone yeah always follow up on those emails and applications and such I will add that the the artists that were the most persistent and the most annoying to me because they called me all the time and asked me every single question on every, they were the most successful. Huh. And it was a eye-opening experience for me as an artist because I had never considered doing, I you know, if I hadn't worked there, I would never consider, you know, calling someone several times and emailing them every question I had about a grant. Um, that's just not the way that I worked, but I understand why it works now. Right. Cause it's your job. If this is, if this is what you want to be your job, if this is how you want to support yourself, you have to be, um, you have to push it a bit. Right. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I like that you mentioned, um, you know, your experience when you were an artist, um, because that's kind of where I'm hoping to take this as well. You got great um, understanding and experience um, from the funder side, but you also are a creator. And so I'm curious, um, what are some of the artist creation grants or professional development grants or any kind of grants that you personally have applied to as an artist that you've been successful in applying to do so? Um, And yeah, what were those grant programs and how did they change the trajectory of your career and your projects? Mm -hmm. Um, so I've received, um, I've received an artist in residence grant from the Ontario Arts Council, which allowed me to work with Cahoots Theatre. I think it was a year for a year. And I actually, um, I actually was exploring how, um, the, the practice of dramaturgy, which is basically like play editing or play editors, if I have to truncate it down to a a quick um, explanation of what it is. I wanted to explore how that process is often very um, colonial in its, in its practice. And if it could be decolonized, if there was a way to work with an editor or someone that was helping you, helping a writer um, that could be, uh, that could be decolonized. So that was one of them. Um, I've had a lot, a lot of small creation grants. Um, So there is a great program at the OAC, um, which is a creation grant that basically the OAC gives theaters money. Yes. And the theaters then create their own little grants. So you can apply to a theater for like $1,000 or $2,000 to create something and it's run through the OAC, but it's the theaters that give the money, if that makes sense. And I received a lot of those. I, you know, um, when I was first starting out in Toronto, I applied to every theater. I was like, I will, whatever that theater was doing. I mean, it wasn't necessarily that effective, but I was like, Oh, this theater only does clown. I don't do clown, but I'm applying to this theater to write a clown show so that they give me $2,000. That wasn't that effective, but the the companies I was actually passionate about, I did apply to and they gave me money and that really helped me learn how to write grants because they were only like a page and a half of writing or showing something, Um, but it also really helped me financially of just, you know, getting from project to project. So those are the kind of grants that I uh, have written personally as an artist and, right. and gotten. And just to, um, I guess, clarify, because I do, when I was like very early on in my career, like I would see this word all the time. So you're talking about recommender grants, right? Yes, it was recommender grants. Right. Yes. So if, yeah. you know, folks go on the Ontario Arts Council, you might see something like, I know publishers have recommender grants as mm-hmm. well. And it'll say, you know, recommender, and it'll talk to you a little bit about, you know, the process and, and who the recommenders are, which I believe, Leah Simone, they change every now and then. They do change like some some companies don't have the capacity to do it anymore or, you know, they come and go. But you can go on the um, Ontario Arts Council website and they'll show you a list, excuse me, of all the companies that participate in those programs. And I do believe they have them across disciplines. And like I said, those that's a really great grant because some sometimes the hardest grants to get are the ten to twenty thousand dollar grants. Right. That's hard. But if you can start building up like, okay, I got, I just got, you know, three of them, that's $6,000. That's going to tide me over until this thing. It's just so helpful. Right. You have another question coming in. I feel like Ricky, like, this is very great. Um, So this is from Erica, she, her. Um, So thanks for your question. Question is, could you speak on unconventional slash creative ways to secure funding outside of big institutions that are equally successful, if not more? Great question. We were going to get to it that later down, but like, why not just get to it now? Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, Leah, uh, if there is, you know, any unconventional slash creative ways that folks can secure funding outside of, you know, the Canada Council, OAC and CEC, um, please, you know, share that with our, our mm-hmm. audience. Well, I would say it, the first thing that, that it takes is the same thing that it takes to get funding from the big institutions, which is a lot of work. So, The way to do it, though, is most people I know, um, most people I know that do really large scale projects get their funding, a core of their funding from somewhere else. And so usually that's either with a sponsorship. So they find, 
a business or um, you know a brand that really they think speaks to the the work that they're doing, and they get they do a partnership with them. Um, so that can be, I mean, most common is actually alcohol. I've seen a lot of alcohol sponsorships. Um, but you know, I knew of an artist who, um, just used to get every kind of sponsorship for her shows. Like there was a show she was doing and they mentioned bread, like offhandedly mentioned bread and Cobb's breads. She got Cobb's breads to sponsor her work which i was like that's that's crazy. genius i would never think to do that well yeah. done you know mm -hmm. so it takes like the creativity is actually looking at your work whatever it is and going what what thing can i what connects to this is it okay it's baking is it paint is it you know what what are the kind of brands or um sponsorships could i get for this so that's one way. Um, the other is uh, fundraisers. And I mean, we, we, most people I think know there are several different ways to crowdfund. Um, but the most successful fundraisers that I've seen are, again, people thinking outside of the box. Um, so like they'll do, um, that's a good example. Okay, well, I'll give you one bizarro example that I did. Um, so I used to, when I was starting out uh, making theater, um, I'm a good pie maker. I'm not, it, they're good, okay? I'm just going to brag about it. They're really good. And so I started baking pies for people. Like I would buy a ton of ingredients and like mark them up and that would be my fundraiser. And so... Um, there was one year when Obsidian Theater, the company I worked for, uh, was doing a side fundraiser for to to try and raise um, money, and we did a pie fundraiser. They just let me do that. There were only two people in the office, and they were just like, "All right, this is a stupid idea, but let's do right. it." And we raised thirty thousand dollars on pies. Pies, guys. Pies. How many pies did you make? Pies. A lot. We had an assembly line at one Ooh. point. Um, I bought a mixer, which actually then paid off. I still have that mixer. So these wow. are the kind of things like, what is, where does your talent be on this piece of art lie? Mm. You might be able to turn that into money. And it, right. um, and it, it, it's a lot of groundwork and it's a lot of work, but that's the kind of thing. Uh, those are some examples of the kind of things that you can do. Right. And so while we're on this topic, let's maybe explore the idea of like an in-kind, like a donation in-kind. So you've got your sponsorship, which is maybe mm -hmm. Cobb's Bread or, you know, Leah Simone's Pies, whoever. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's the, the things that have a value attached to them, like a dollar value, um, but you, mm -hmm. you don't ever receive that money uh, mm -hmm. for your projects. That might be free space. That might be free use of rental equipment, free use of a pie maker. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe talk us through uh, leveraging in-kind donations to get your ideas off the ground and how you might be able to do that. Yeah, they're super important uh, too. Mm -hmm. So the term uh, in-kind, you'll see a lot in granting. Right. You'll, they'll ask you when you're creating a budget, show us the money that you get uh, in the budget and also show us in-kind donations yeah. with a money value. And in-kind basically means stuff you get for free. Mm -hmm. So if someone gives you free space, if someone gives you a free, uh, you know, car to use during your creation time that you can pick up stuff, whatever it is. Um, and those things, uh, I think, are just as valuable as the money, mm -hmm. because if you can get uh, a free studio or if you can get free rehearsal space. Significant. Free studio time. I mean, that's that's usually what you're raising the money for right then. Right. Um, so mostly the artists that I know and that I've seen um, will get a bit of free space, maybe a bit of equipment, a bit, you know, it's just here and there, but it does add up. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's really all about your relationships that you have with people. So if you've been renting equipment for, from, um, you know, a music venue for a long time, you can go to them and say, look, we've done this over the years. Could you throw in some 
you know, free microphone stands or whatever. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that will come with a, a recognition request from the person who's giving you this in-kind donation or the sponsorship. So what are some ways that you have seen, because it's something that people should be considering if you are receiving, you know, bread from Cobbs, like you're going to typically be asked to recognize that. And that's where that alignment to your work and then the, the business or the brand uh, comes into play. I've seen like Absolute Vodka, you know, sponsoring mm -hmm. a lot of productions, but now you've got to recognize vodka at your show, um, which is something that you might need to consider. So how would you consider you know um letting folks know when you are taking in these uh donations and these uh sponsorship things what are some things to just keep in mind when it comes to recognition and thanking your your sponsors and donors publicly i know for the podcast there's like a little line that you'll have mm -hmm. to read um for people who support the podcast but what are some other great ways of recognition well it's huge you always have to recognize or else you're not going to get that sponsorship again and that's usually why people are doing it. Mm -hmm. So it can come on uh, you know it can be anything from your social media presence recognizing them and a couple of in on Instagram posts or on Twitter or it can be um recognizing them like if it's a if it's uh you know a a music show, then putting it on your poster, right? Like that it's one of your sponsors with their logo. Mm -hmm. And I think it just depends what your agreement is with them. Mm -hmm. They might not ask anything from you and you still have to find a way to recognize them. Or they might say like, you have to actually put, you know, the, theater show sponsored by Cobb's bread. You might have, it's, really the the company has right i'm feeling like my internet's lagging so if i do miss out like if i skip a beat it's because okay. my internet is also skipping a beat okay um okay. so i think it's gonna be a great opportunity to talk about uh maybe just going back to some of the more uh i wouldn't say traditional grant writing but in all applications for funds whether it be a gofundme or a sponsorship or your traditional grant, you're gonna have to talk about your art and what exactly you're doing and why you're doing it, why it's important to you and you know how it's important to the community at large. And one thing that we know black artists particularly have a hard time doing is kind of breaking down some of the themes that we often take up in our work um, in a way that can be received with uh, or through the granting audience. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, sometimes we'd be looking at like a peer panel who's reviewing your work. Sometimes it's just one person. Um, but how can you talk about your work that uh, allows you to uphold your artistic integrity and you're not breaking down uh, your things into something that's like super reduced and like redacted, mm -hmm. it's basically nothing, but that also is um, readable and understandable to the person that you're applying for funds for. You know, and we can use the major institutions as an example. You know, they're doing a lot of work to diversify the juries, but sometimes mm -hmm. you're writing uh, a grant on something that's very very unique to the black experience in your black community and you have no idea who you're writing this to as far as you're concerned it's a room full of non uh black mm -hmm. or non UC people what's yeah. a great way to navigate situations like that well i think the first thing to do is to practice mm -hmm. um so get everybody has to have an artist statement it doesn't matter what you're applying for and so getting you know condensing your artistic everything down to a statement is really hard. Mm -hmm. And so I would say practice that, you know, write it once, leave it for a couple of weeks, come back to it. You'll want to edit it. And then the other thing that you need to do after you've done that is give it to a friend mm. who maybe, or a person maybe in your family or just someone that's a little bit separate from your artistic practice yeah. and see if they understand what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's key. Yeah. But I would also really encourage people to not water down who they are and their expression. Yeah. And so what I mean by that is you can talk about a very specific practice, um, uh, cultural aspect, talk about who you are. And I don't think that you have to, I think you have to go for clarity in whatever you're doing. Hmm. I don't think that you have to try and really change um, who you are, your artistic practice to, to let it fit into something. Right. So a good example of that is um, I always give this example, but Donna Michelle St. Bernard is a, she's a writer and an MC and I was in a rehearsal with her once and we were talking about, is this clear? It was something 
Uh, she's written a, th- a, a, a series of plays called the 54 ology. So it's 54 plays about Africa, every country in Africa. Mm-hmm. And so we were talking about the clarity of something. And she said, you know, in movies and in TV and in theater, no one ever explains what a cross is. Mm-hmm. You never see someone in a scene go, oh, is, oh this cross is um, about the Christian religion. Jesus, you know, like nobody does that hardly. Right. Right. And so she said, we have to start pushing the expectation of, of people and what we have to explain to them. Right. You don't always have to explain everything that's important to us. So I have seen artists that are able to do that, that are are like, I'm working on this very specific thing that, you know, maybe I come from a community of like, 300 people in this place. Mm -hmm. It's specific. What I want to do with that specific thing is this. Mm -hmm. And that's where the clarity comes. I don't think you have to explain the art, but I think you have to explain what you want to do. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And I think I would even follow up with, it's great to explain what you do, but sometimes it can be challenging to explain the significance of that. So you come Mm -hmm. from a community of 300 people, but oftentimes, you know, the councils and even sponsors, they have these grand ideas of their own. This is what we want to fund. We want to things that chat. We want to fund things that challenge and provoke and question and things like that. So explaining the significance of a cultural item from a a town of 300 people can be challenging. And Mm -hmm. I, it's a very big question that I'm posing to you, but what are some ways that you can do that? So again, you're not watering it down, but you understand that the significance might not be as broad as maybe your, your funder wants it to be, or maybe it is, and you just need to do a great job of communicating that. Yeah, I think just tell the truth. Tell mm. the truth of that. This mm. thing is important because it's, very, it's integral to this community of 300 people, right. and that's why I want to work on it. It's not right. for everyone. I'm doing this for my community. Because the thing is now that has changed with funding is before I think, yes, people were like, oh, it's for 300 people, who cares? Like we want it to reach the most people or or whatever the perception is. That's changed. I would say um, what I've seen around the jury panels, uh, jury tables of artists, Mm -hmm. they're really interested in specificity. And Mm -hmm. so I think actually you can go further with that and talk about why this will be a change making thing for that community because that community has probably never seen this on stage or m- never seen this reflected in art or whatever. And that's why you need the funding. Right. You know, think of it this way, like um, it's another theater terminology. So I'm sorry for all the people who are not theater, mm-hmm. but to be as broad as possible, we've seen a million Romeo and Juliet's. Okay. Maybe more. But- Maybe more. What we haven't seen is X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is what other artists right now are really excited about. It's that specificity. So don't be scared of it, but it needs to be clear in terms of what you're doing. So it can't just be like, I'm community 300 and we have this thing and, you know, we feel so much joy around it and I'm going to make something. Hmm. That's, that's the problematic part. It has to be, and I am going to interview all of my community. Mm-hmm. Um, there's going to be an online portal where we come together and sing songs and share stories. Mm-hmm. And at the end, there will be, a, visu- there will be a, a visual art show where we present, you know, whatever. Right, right. We have a question in my, uh, you know, Ricky Lake uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> role now. So this is uh, from Erica again. The question is, mm-hmm. are there funding opportunities for cross-cultural or international projects? Great question. Mm-hmm. This is a great pres- uh, question. Yes, there are. So um, mostly for international, well, okay. I'll just kind of quickly try and break it down for you. Mm-hmm. So Toronto Arts Council, do they fund cross cultural cultural or international projects? Yes. Will they fund your travel to another place? No, because mm. they're the Toronto Arts Council and they only get their money to support things that happen in Toronto. And so if everybody from away is coming here to work with you, mm. that would probably be more successful than you going there, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. That's the Toronto Arts Council. Mm-hmm. The Ontario Arts Council does fund 
um, travel so you can go over wherever. They also fund people coming here and they'll also fund um, large, you know, larger scale, uh, um, larger scale projects that might tour or go different places, Mm -hmm. but they are specifically for artists in Ontario doing stuff. So it has to benefit the artists in Ontario kind of more than it does someone somewhere else, if that makes sense. And then the Canada Council funds all of those things, funds travel, funds you going away and doing whatever it is you want to do, and then funds touring and international co-productions as well. Right. Are there some things that folks should keep in mind when it comes to travel, like how to create a budget? And this is like a a much larger conversation, but Mm -hmm. things like budgeting, things like um, being invited. I know that's a big deal of like I was invited to do something in this country or I'm inviting Mm -hmm. this person invitation letters very quickly because this could be like a whole series of. uh, Yeah, I'll I'll boil it down to the three things that you definitely need. One, um, proof that someone wants you to come there or that they're coming. So yeah. it could be a letter, but it could just be, um, you know, uh, an email from the artist or uh, plane tickets hmm. Two, um, you have to be very clear about where the money is going. Hmm. So it's not, I need $10,000 to go to, you know, Nigeria for a year and just chill out. Yeah. No, you have to be really clear about what you're going to do there and still show a good breakdown of I'm, I'm paying for, you know, space and whatever else. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third thing is if it's a, those, the f- first two things you really need are, can be for uh, individual artists or if you're doing a group project. Mm -hmm. The third thing just pertains to a group project Mm -hmm. and that is um, co-production support. So you probably will need, if it's a huge thing and you're traveling and touring, you usually need to have some other company supporting that work Mm -hmm. as well. Unless you're like a multi-million dollar company, you usually need to have support in other places. Right. Right. Good to know. Yeah, this is a whole, when I learned that you could apply for like, even at the Ontario Arts Council level, money to like travel and, and do things mm-hmm. overseas. I, we did an art session, an art session, a professional development grant writing session uh, with Paulina O'Keefe Anthony. And she was exploring how she was able to receive professional development money from OAC to travel to Trinidad to create a piece of work there um, and speak to elders and et cetera. So they certainly do support intercultural and international travel for sure. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have another question. Um, how do you answer the question? I think it's what value does your work bring to Canada or society? Huge question. Yeah, I know. I those, don't envy you, but Leah, please take a stab. <laughs> well, I mean, those are the kind of questions that are in grants and yep, they are they they are they are problematic because I think one of the things that uh funding tries to do is they try to create um a questionnaire that can serve a bunch of different programs. So they make the questions very huge Mm -hmm. so that a dancer can answer it and a theater person and a visual artist, but that doesn't really help any of us. So I think, um, again, you can be specific. Canada includes you and it includes your practice and your community. So if you just want to say like, I'm doing this thing for, um, you know, the 10 people who will come to my show, that is the question of how it's going to benefit Canada. Are those Canadians that are coming? Yes. I think a lot of times artists get caught up in like trying to answer that big question of like, it will affect multiple generations of Canadians as they think about my work or whatever, or society. Um, But, you know, also when you're doing bigger projects, you can also say you can also really define who your audience is. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't do that well. They'll just say, oh, my audience is other musicians or people who like music. Mm-hmm. My audience is people who like theater. That's not a great answer. Mm-hmm. You can say my audience is probably, you know, for this piece, we think it's probably a little older. We think it's like 30 and up or this one's for like 18 year olds and under who do this. Just be specific, right. I would say. 
appreciate that. I've been confronted with that question often, and I'm like, how is this one project going to impact all of Canada, yeah. all of its provinces and territories? Like, it's 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 large, but you're right, it's large by nature, um, yeah. and, and specificity is key in that for sure. And that's a great question because, and I should also mention if anyone is curious or like, let's just go over housekeeping. If you do go into the question Q and A panel, you can see the questions that have been asked, and then uh, there's an abridged version of the answer typed out as well. So you can go back and if you're just coming in, you can see some of the questions that have been asked so far. Um, and always feel free to type in a question in the chat in the Q and A, and then we'll we'll get to it during the conversation. Great questions so far. Just yeah, really great. Through, like whatever you. Now's the time. Now's the time. Now's yeah. the time. So this is great because it leads us into our conversation about um, the way that granting is designed inadvertently or intentionally to be mm -hmm. inaccessible. Mm -hmm. um, you can sometimes think of it as like, I've heard some grant applications are designed to be really large and like labor intensive because they don't want too many people applying for them. Mm -hmm. so they don't have to go through like hundreds of grants, right? So just getting to the end of the grants is already like a win. Like they can tell you're, you're serious or whatever. Um, but what are some ways from like the funder perspective and also as an artist who's um, applied for many grants that you you see grants being systemically designed to keep folks out, particularly new emerging Black artists who might be applying for their first grant or have maybe applied for a few grants and have just been unsuccessful and are wondering like what this wall is that's being created. How much time do we have? Okay, here, <laughs> let's start here. Mm. The, 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 the largest one is that funding or you know the funders that we have now, it's built on a British system. It was the British that came up with funding arts, which by the way, we love getting funded as art. Like that's mm -hmm. not the problem, but the system is part of the larger system that is based on the British kind of colonial way of working. Mm -hmm. So, and it's a bureaucratic system. It's inherently bureaucratic. So when I say bureaucratic, what I mean is it's a paper system. It's a written system that doesn't work with a lot of people. And uh, I would say for a lot of black artists, you know, who um, are connected to oral traditions, who are connected, maybe especially in this day and age, to using video, to just expressing themselves not through the written word. That's one of the biggest barriers, I would say, is mm -hmm. just the writing and then that connects to the language that they use in grants. Mm. So it's also inherently tied to this colonial system. Right. So it's better now, and I know that a lot of funders are really working on making it as accessible as possible, but it's still inaccessible because I worked in funding for years and I still mostly didn't understand what people were talking about mm. in the respect that, they use a lot of acronyms. They use a lot of words that you're just like, what does that mean? You know, you have to Google a lot. And, you know, I, I think it's inherently a, a rigged system mm -hmm. for black artists because it's this, it's tied to the same system that everything else in, you know, North America and Europe is tied to, which is right. colonialism. Inherently it's colonialism. Right. And so are funders at this point doing all they can to change the system? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are juries now inherently um, uh, equitable? Yes, they have to be. That is part of the, the structure and the guidelines that they're working with now. It, it, there are no more all white juries or like all male juries, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. That being said, to me, it's not about the black artists who are applying. Mm -hmm. It's about the black artists who never apply, who never even feel like it is a place that they could apply, who mm -hmm. don't. So I would say like the websites are inaccessible also to, um, you know, people with accessibility issues, disabled people, disabled people are also black as we know. <laughs> so, right. you know, um, I, I do feel like, there are that the biggest problem and the biz, biggest barrier is that um, black artists don't even feel like it's a place for them that they would not even succeed mm -hmm. and that's the biggest problem mm. so one of the ways um, 
But one of the, you know, the ways that it's changing and not, I will just say, is when I worked there, when I came in, the, the job title was theater officer. Mm -hmm. So all of the people who work in funding, if they run programs, they're called officers. Yeah, which is great um, language, right? If you want to attract uh, folks from certain communities. Sarcasm is, is being... No, 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 I know. I'm, it's is a bizarre. It's completely bizarre. And we know all the things, like I don't have to explain inherently why that is, is problematic language and puts fear, you know, puts fear in a lot of people. Um, and I had a, a colleague who was retiring the year I was coming in, but she told me that she actually had worked with a black organization who had applied, gotten funding. And then there's a whole thing after you get funded, like years later, you have to submit reports. You have to just say, this is what we did with this and whatever. And it's, it's really um, just red tape in terms of the job that um, people in funding have to do to kind of prove that you've used the money. But it's not, it doesn't go to a government organ, like it doesn't, we don't send it to the city. No one's going to come to your house if but you. But it can feel like you do. Them. Yeah, it can certainly. Right. Feel like you do. Well, because it's because first of all, we're called officers. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't know, you're thinking this is definitely punitive. And she told me that this group that she had worked with that were first time applicants never, she just never heard from them again. Basically, mm -hmm. had to chase them down. And then this the guy who was running the organization um, was a, a new to Canada, an mm -hmm. immigrant. I can't remember what country he was from, but he basically said, we thought that we were going to probably maybe get arrested or maybe that, that, you know, maybe that would affect my, my status Yeah, because we couldn't get the documents together on time. And I, Paul, and so she had to explain to him. So, yeah. so long story short, too late. Um, I really petitioned them that, officer was so archaic yep. and that that is a barrier right there that could come down. So now at the Toronto Arts Council, everyone's called a program manager, yep. mm. but you'll notice at the other councils, they're, they're still called officers. And I, I do expect that that will change, but those are the, the little things mm. that they might not even notice from day to day that are huge things right. in our community. And, um, and you know, you have someone named officer and then you have this like 10 page application. Right. It's very intimidating. It's very daunting. And so, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I kind of went on long there. I can't remember. No, it's the, great. The, yeah. All these pieces just really spill out how it keeps people out of funding. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, cause I really enjoy it. Like I'll go in and see who receives funding, what organizations receive funding. Um, mm -hmm. And often, you know, if they're my peers, like I want to congratulate them or I can directly tie it to the work and be like, okay, cool. This is how this program, you know, funds its artists, et cetera. Um, but you'll often see like repeat artists, which is great, but it's because like they're, they're comfortable in the system and right. you know, you, they know the people and the language and the, the officers or managers, but it leaves so many people out of it because a lot of the success in granting comes from being comfortable with granting and the people who are included in granting. And so especially mm -hmm. when we're looking at new generation artists, uh, new voices, they don't have those connections. Also, it's not about connections. It's also about time. Hmm. Yep. Who has the time to sit down and write one of these applications? Right. Who has the time to dedicate to their art in the first place? Right. A lot of times it's financial. A lot of times there are great artists who are like, I just, I do not have the time in my day due to my family obligations and my work obligations to do this kind of work. Yeah. And so that's something I really noticed in funding. Like I was like the people who, remember I told you about the annoying people who call all the time and like have yep. a million I questions. Yep. Those were the white people. Yep. To be yep. honest, yep. lovely people. They were all white because they all had the time to just like focus on this thing. Yep. And so that's the other barrier. It's like in, in funding, they expect you to have the time to to dedicate and make it your job. Well, how are you supposed to do that if you're not making any money on it? Like it's this, this cycle. Yeah. The, there was one more thing I was going to say about, um, okay. The other barrier that I think is huge is um, organizational. So when organizations like a NIA center or like an obsidian or whoever are applying for grants, they also have to check off a lot of guidelines and have a lot of things in place. Yep. One of those things is a board. 
Mm-hmm. They have to have board members. They have to be incorporated. Charitable and status. Yep. Charitable status. And I feel like what funding is still doing is dictating how black people are supposed to run organizations like the, the, the structure. Right. So there are a lot of black organizations that do not run that way. That don't, that run in a circle. They don't run up and down. You know what I'm saying? It's a colonial structure too, that you're trying to fit on for this organization. Yep. It is. And so there are a lot of organizations that I just don't have those things those things in place and it doesn't work for them they're like we can't get all these people on a board or we don't want a board that way or that's just not how we work right. so um yeah good to know it's also really challenging um and i know we're, we're running out of time slowly but uh it's really difficult because um you know when we talk about who has time to apply for these brands we do a lot of these grant writing coaching sessions and training sessions. And it's often like the biggest question, start early. It takes a lot of time. Don't underestimate Mm -hmm. how much time Mm -hmm. it takes to write this grant because it's, it's also like, I have to remind ourselves that I don't want to deter people from writing grants because it does take a lot of time, but I'm reminding people that like, this also might not be for you because it does take tons Mm -hmm. of time and you have to start early. And you know, if you work many jobs and shift work and it's also a pandemic, I'm asking you, or I'm encouraging you to apply for this grant, but also recognizing that you likely don't have time to, to create the grants and create the artist statements and the bios and the support material because of the way that they're designed, which is, again, we could probably plan a whole other session on just like the systemic barriers of uh, grant writing. Oh but my I, wanna, I could talk all day. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get some more. I think we have more we questions. Do. Yeah. Um, and I just want to do a quick time check and reminder. So it's 7.03. We go until 7.30. Um, so we're going to go through these questions. And then I think we talk a little bit about support material and then we can wrap it up. I do have some notes on budgets and et cetera, but I'll remind people that Kevin Ray, who is the current community um, arts program manager at the Rotan Arts Council, has filmed an amazing hour-long grant writing conversation with us. It's on our YouTube Kevin channel. Kevin is amazing. Kevin's A1, amazing. he's fantastic. Mm-hmm. He does a great job of breaking down some of the more specifics when it comes to grant writing budget etc so if we don't get to some of those more specific items i'll email everyone the link to all the conversations um, and then again always questions are welcome in the q a but we have a question right here i'm currently developing a long-term project that's starting with a podcast very exciting are there grants specifically for podcasts and digital art projects mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's a great question mm-hmm. um so a lot is changing very quickly um because podcasts are becoming especially right now um so at the toronto arts council um you can apply the visual and media arts program are under the same umbrella and media arts can cover podcasting it can cover you know a youtube series whatever so you could apply there depending oh i think the question went away oh no you're answering it yeah but Um, let me read it too um are the are there grants specifically for podcast and digital art projects? Um, and she also mentions that she's developing a long-term project that's starting with the podcast. Okay. So I don't know what her discipline is, but um, depending on what your discipline is, you can apply for a creation grant for a podcast. So for instance, like if it was uh, something to do with theater, you could a- apply for a creation grant to get kind of seed money to do the podcast. Mm-hmm. Um the music program also has creation money, but it actually kind of depends what it's about because mm-hmm. that you can usually connect what it's about to the program and get some creation money. Mm-hmm. The thing about podcasting right now, like I know um, Canada has a whole program, um, right? So I would, doubt, but a lot of them, it, it, it's new, so it's a bit trickier to get funding for them. They yeah, kind of um, jump in very quickly. So a lot of people. I don't know if it's my end, but I think the last maybe thirty seconds of what you said for me at least cut out. So I don't know if it cut out for okay. other folks, but maybe go back thirty seconds and. Sure. And, oh. uh, basically, what I was saying is, you always have to tie the the podcast to the discipline of like whatever it is you're doing. If it's a murder mystery, maybe apply in writing. If it's. Um, Oh yeah, someone's saying it's cutting out a bit. It's weird. It it seems to be working on my end. Um, uh, 
but podcasting, getting funding right now, um, you can do it at the Canada Council. They have a huge new digital program. Mm, amazing. Okay, I'm just typing it out so folks can see. Canada Council, a huge. You called it digital media program? Yeah, I think that's what it's called. It has digital in it, but don't Great. quote me on. Great. Yeah. And while we're on the topic of podcasts, are there other like unique places that folks can go to to receive funding for podcasts? Like, I don't know if there's like indie producers or, you know, people like sponsors. Like, I think Staples at one point was looking to like sponsor a few podcasts um, because they have like a podcast studio out in Oakville or something that I had just seen. But are there different avenues that folks can take to get, uh, you know, different kinds of support to get their podcasts off the ground? Now that it's a pandemic, I think everyone, including myself, is turning to podcasting. So I'm seeing it as like a emerging field for sure Mm -hmm. it i will be completely honest as a person who does a podcast it's very difficult to get Mm -hmm. um sponsorship for podcasts unless you have a certain number of downloads right so you really have to prove the listenership first before they'll ask to sponsor you right um but that being said i do think it it is similar to what i was talking about of like thinking outside the box and getting the bread sponsorship mm-hmm. um you know i have a friend who does a sponsorship uh got a sponsorship for her s- small podcast they do like sleep stories you know like quieter mm-hmm. stories to put you to mm-hmm. sleep and they did get like a toronto specific mac- mattress place to sponsor them mm-hmm. so i think you know, knowing you're not going to get um, Coca-Cola or whoever to sponsor your podcast, you might be able to get specific with it. Right. Yeah. Sounds good. Another question we have here. Um, this is such a great webinar, raising all the points I feel and have experienced. Also amazing speaker. I really feel connected with her and am warmed by her analysis. Mm-hmm. Most visual artists are good at creating art, creating art, I should say, but not good at writing communication. I love that. Is there any help for that? Does Nia help with that? Nia certainly does help with that. Um, not in a like more like sustained basis. Like I can't direct you to a place on our website where you can go and receive support with that. Um, like I did mention with those videos that we filmed, we have two specifically with Fiona Ray Clark and Lizzie Kiriko, um, who talk specifically about how to write about yourself and your art. Um, particularly from a creative writing and visual art practice. Um, But this is something to certainly keep in mind because I know folks are really interested in learning how to better communicate who they are and what they do to different audiences. Um, But I'll just reiterate the question for you, Leah. Um, Mm -hmm. Most visual artists are good at creating art, but not good at writing communication. Is there any help for that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I know in Toronto anyway, the uh, the Toronto Arts Council offers... um, Well, it's not in person anymore, but they will offer at some point, I guess, a a virtual writing sessions where you can kind of practice writing your grants and the program manager, they'll put someone, it might not be the visual arts program manager, but they just kind of help you clarify. They ask you questions. The other thing is um, I would just try writing pieces of the grant that need to be written and then sending it to the the program manager and asking if it's good. People would do that all the time too. They would just say, can you look over this part of the grant and see, does it make sense to you? Um, The key to that is you have to do it in advance. Don't send it on the same day and ask for feedback, but you can ask for feedback and, and just announce it. Just say, I need help. I'm not a writer. I, I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Yeah. And so I'm also, um, when I was very early starting out writing grants, I had no idea, kind of like when you're in university and like you want to show your answers to the prof and they're like, oh, I can't read this, you know, et cetera. I kind of took that same feeling into like approaching grant managers and grant officers because I thought there'd be this weird like conflict of interest if I asked them to read my grant in advance. But that's such a misconception that I had to learn mm-hmm. that can you really just approach your grant manager and officer and say, this is what I've written, send me feedback, you know, what can I do better? Can they look at your budget, support material? What does that look like? So definitely you can't, the TAC, I don't want to say that you can do that everywhere. I'm pretty sure you can't do it at the Canada Council because the amount of people applying for their programs, they just couldn't. And I I don't know about the OAC, but TAC, you can, and you have to do it in advance. I would say about a month. Okay. So you really got to get your stuff together. And we know as artists and myself included, I completely procrastinate and never, I would never be able to do that, but (laughs) a month to be sure, at least two weeks. 
Got it. Before, okay. Got it. Um, they will give you feedback on things that they think. So like when I did it, I would say like, you're missing this part. Like mm. you forgot your budget or you never mentioned this thing. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to need to know that. We're not going to tell you if you, you're going to get the grant or not. We're not going to tell you if your art is good if right. or not. That's, our, that's opinions, but we're they'll go over and just kind of say like, okay, you hit all the things that they asked. Every question's answered. Right. Um, yeah. Good to know. Um, let's move into support material while we're talking about the grants and things that you need to include. We did talk about your artist statement, your artist bio, your artist CV. Ideally, those are something that you like you prepare. You've gotten like a little Rolodex that you can access. But um, I want to talk about when you're an emerging artist who maybe doesn't have a large body of work mm -hmm. or you're creating mm -hmm. something that's very new and novel and you don't really have anything to support it in terms of things that you created. For example, you might be a dancer and all of a sudden you're creating a podcast or you're creating a visual piece of art. Um, what can you include as support material when you don't think that you have at least a body of work um, that's large enough to, to submit? And that might just come from like not feeling confident about your work mm -hmm. or having only mm -hmm. done like one thing in school. Um, yeah, what does that look like in terms of providing support material when you might feel like you don't have enough or anything really to show? So um, I would say really briefly, there's always something to show. Mm -hmm. You know, even if you have like a couple paragraphs of your writing, even if it's a clip of you dancing in rehearsal, mm -hmm. um, submit that. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, if you're a super new artist um, and there is nothing, support material could just be a letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Support material could just be pictures of your show that you did in school. It doesn't have to be, you know... Again, it's, it, there's no consequences to this. It, there's no one's going to punish you if you don't have like a dissertation you can, right? right? right. So I would say show the best you can, but be careful because the biggest thing that I've seen around tables is people love their app, up an application and then they get to the support material and they're like, oh, is that, mm. oh, that's what it is. And that's because people put up video um, th they submit video that they haven't edited. Mm. So it's like a 15 minute grainy video where we can't see what you're doing and the music's off. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're going to submit video, edit it, make mm -hmm. sure it looks good. Um, if it's a piece of writing, you can make it short. It doesn't have to be, you know, again, like a novel. Right. And Oh, the other thing I would say, especially to new artists is the biggest misconception is that you're new, nobody knows you, nobody's going to want to fund your work. Right. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's the senior artists and mid-level artists that mm -hmm. everyone's like, well, we've seen this before, mm -hmm. but look at this new person that we've never heard of that's doing this exciting thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually the reverse. So if you're new and you don't have much on your resume, interesting. everyone's going to be really excited that huh. you've come to the table. Yeah, that's actually really great um, information for you to share because I do think a lot of, even myself, I'm like an emerging writer. I'm always like, I've only got this one thing and I'm like super new and no one's even like, who is this girl? Let's knock her application off the table kind of thing. But it's interesting to hear that that's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to talk about support material when you're collaborating. And I know some folks in here are working on larger collaborative projects. Um, how do you like distill? So we went from one end where it's like, I don't know if I have enough, but what if you've got like, tons and tons and tons of work from you mm -hmm. and your collaborators and your co-producers and sometimes often it's like only submit 10 pieces or five pieces or only five minute video what does that work look like in curating and you know synthesizing all of the support material into something that like very directly speaks to the project that you're looking to receive funding for the best support material is from the project itself mm -hmm. so if you have that submit that the second best is something that's at least can speak to the kind of work you're making. So for instance, you know, if it's a whole group of collaborators um, from different artistic paths that are coming together to create a dance piece, mm -hmm. then your, some of your support material should be dance and it should be good. Right. And so that's, the thing is, is that when people are reading grants, these are your peers, these are other artists. Um, by the way, 
most important thing that you all should know is you should apply to be on a jury. Um, yeah. Everybody can be on a jury. It doesn't matter what your experience is, who you are, whatever, be on a jury. All you have to do is send an email to the, the program managers and say, um, here's my resume and I'd like to be on a jury and they'll put you on a long list and eventually you'll be on a jury. So it's very exciting. It might take like a year or two, mm -hmm. but anyway, um, so the ju jury is just other artists and they, you know, by the time they get to your application, they've seen all of this support material. Right. Keep it short, keep it concise, right. a bit of writing, a bit of video. Do not, don't submit like 20 pieces of support material. Right. Unless it asks for 20 or like I, that's always a question that I've always heard as well. Like it asks for, if it asks, I think there's like, so let's say community arts with OAC. Like I think you can mm -hmm. submit like up to 20 pieces of support material. But that's, you can submit up to 20. Mm -hmm. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. And you probably shouldn't because mm -hmm. no one, people are going to get to like number 15 and be like, I'm so tired, you know? <laughs> so I would say five, you know, right. no more than five good, clean, nice pieces. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And you did mention reference letters and letters of support. What does that do for an application? Because sometimes it's not always required. Like you'll have like little asterisks of like, you must sub submit this and you must submit this. And you might want to submit a reference letter or a letter of support. What does that do to your application? Does it help move it forward? Does it give people a little bit of a cosign? Like, oh, this person really thinks that this person's, you know, worth their weight and salt or whatever. Um, tell us about the, the significance and the impact of a letter of support and where you might go to find that okay so I'll be honest with you I think most times it doesn't matter hmm. because if you've written a tremendous grant and your art is amazing it doesn't matter what that person thinks hmm. and vice versa like Maya Angelou RIP could write you her uh, support you know letter yes. and if you if you're grants bad it doesn't it doesn't actually matter mm -hmm. when it does matter mm -hmm. is with community so this is the big thing that I see mm -hmm. when people are applying and they're saying like okay we're, we're working on a thing about mental health and we are going to partner with CAMH or we're gonna work with people with you know XYZ disorder mm -hmm. and they don't have any support from the community from the mental health community from experts or the people themselves mm -hmm. that's the application that's not going to get funded mm -hmm. so I think when you're working with specific communities that are not your own or you know it could be your own but you're there has to be care there and like the biggest thing that I've I noticed I mean I left the TAC last year was the amount of uh, applications that didn't get funded because they said that they were working with indigenous people and didn't have, there were no names, there was no community letters attached. So that's, that's the one place that I think they really count. Right, when you're working with community. And I guess when you're doing those like larger, um, you know, international or cross Canada projects, would you say it's also that's where those letters might come in handy as well and knowing that yeah, we're excited to have this person come to Nunavut or Montreal or, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, really believe in the work that they're doing and they're going to extend this in this community and things like that to position your letters of support to, you know, showcase the potential of your work on a larger scale, especially when you're traveling. And you might be frozen. Definitely, definitely need a letter of support if traveling. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, I think I'm just cutting out. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm going to say say everything over again for us. Sorry. Okay, I actually didn't really say much because oh, okay. I thought I was cutting out. I didn't say Got anything. It. Got it. Um, but yes, basically, yes, you need a letter of support if you're traveling, just so that they know that you're going there. Yeah. Very good to know. So we're wrapping up into the last, you know, 10 minutes of our conversation. So I will say, I know people have been sending in questions um, periodically, but if there's something that comes to mind that you've been hanging on to or that we haven't had a chance to get to, um, I invite you to send this into the Q&A or the chat, whatever is uh, most comfortable for you. Um, and then I just wanted to quickly touch on, uh, we won't go too much into budgets, but we'll just end on like, you know, paying yourself. 
we talked a lot about how you know folks are busy and and working many jobs and just this whole grant system is really difficult but once you have applied for this grant it's important to recognize that your work has value and the hours you're putting in has value or the hours of your collaborators have value but how do you assign a number to that how do you figure out what to pay yourself are you paying yourself minimum wage or is there like a mm. rate card that you can uh, review? How will the jury perceive the number that you've put? If it's too low, will that hurt your chances? If it's too high, talk us through what it looks like to pay yourself as an artist when submitting a request for funding, whether private funding or these larger granting institutions. Well, the, the good thing is the goal of funders is to pay artists. So you definitely should pay yourself. A lot of artists won't even add themselves in the budget. I mean, they do weird things. They don't pay themselves. So pay yourself. Um, uh, you know, every, every discipline, every artistic practice has rates or kind of guidelines. Um, theater definitely does uh, through equity that you can search online or, um, you know, designers have rates. Um, so do dancers. So always go by those guidelines and, but also be practical. Mm -hmm. So if you're applying for a $2,000 grant um, to have some writing time, sure. you could say, um, I'm, I'm paying myself $2,000. That's where the $2,000, it's just me. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Um, that's fair. Uh, if it's a $10,000 project, you know, Again, look at the rates, figure it out. Is it $600 a week that you want to pay yourself for, you know, three weeks and then you pay someone else? Mm -hmm. But I, I think the, there's no, I would not say that I've seen a lot of applications where people go, wow, they're paying themselves too much. Mm -hmm. No, I haven't seen that. But I have seen, why are they only budgeting $10 a week for themselves? <laughs> like, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. So just... Just try and pay yourself um, and and you can look at those guidelines. Yeah. What are so I know like CARFAC is I, I hate to use acronyms, but I forget mm -hmm. what CARFAC stands for. I think the Canadian artists uh, rights. Rights, okay, yeah. Rights and then it's French, so it's like something I wish I knew what CARFAC stood for, but it's a great resource for visual artists, curators, uh, even writers sometimes to figure out what the rates are. Um, I think there's a Writers Guild of Canada, but what are some of the other like places that you can go to for these rates and these standards? Yeah, I mean, uh, Playwrights Canada Pre or Playwrights Guild, uh, basically any artistic discipline that you're a part of mm -hmm. will have an organization, some kind of organization. Mm, so the right. easiest way to do it is just put in like visual artists, you know, into Google visual artists, C Canada organization, and right. one will come up. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way to point yourself. Cause I, I definitely don't know all of them. There's so many of them. Mm. Um, but yeah. also the other thing that people forget to do is just ask, mm. um, ask, uh, other people you work with other if you know if you're a visual artist ask other visual artists what they pay themselves um, right. try to figure out what the working practices right. is, are of other artists yeah asking seems to be the name of the game here in this this conversation is sometimes you just need to ask for what you need ask for the information ask for the resources and ask for the help you know um if your friend has applied for grants before or maybe you have peers who are more comfortable in, in paying themselves or you see that this is something that they do what do you pay yourself or oh you did that one project how much did they pay you or just kind of ask me a center you know uh we can certainly kind of demystify some of those rates as well um and we use those same uh guiding principles and standards just like many artists do as well so we use carfac same way that a lot of visual arts use carfac and artists will often hold us to that like okay this is my carfac rate and i'm like great mm -hmm. Same for us. Um, and also, I also like to mention that those are just standards and like minimums. And you could always like pay yourself above that as well. So if you do see Absolutely. one of these rates and it's like we recommend 50 an hour, you're like, okay, cool, 75. You know, it doesn't always have to be the number. Just understand what your time is worth. And, um, you know, the, the holistic understanding of you and your work is always helpful. 
I would also say to add to that asking thing, because we're just finishing up. So this is kind of my, the thesis of this entire, I'm going to make a thesis no. statement, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> and the thesis statement is that um, being an artist is lonely. It's, it can be inherently lonely, right. um, especially if you work in a discipline that is a lot of solo practice, but just right now. And so I think the thing that all artists do at some point is they convince themselves that, um, you know, they get in their head and they, we tell stories to ourselves. We tell stories about why our work isn't of value, why we shouldn't apply, why I'm not going to, you know, all of those things. And I would say you have to open that up and you have to start asking questions. You have to start being pushier. Mm -hmm. um, you be, I, you know, my dream is that all the black artists start getting annoying. You know, <laughs> like when I worked in funding, it was all the white artists that were like, I'm going to use all your time to ask you 500 questions and they would get the grants. Right. And I want that for black artists. Why can't we be annoying? So we um, can, <laughs> we can. We can. Yeah. So I would say just, just remember that it's a very intimidating um, landscape funding is, and it's hard to ask someone to pay you. It's hard to just, it's, it's just, it just feels awkward, but um, it's there for you. It's actually designed to pay you. Um, and the other thing attached to this is that granting writing grants is hard and you will get some, you are going to get some grants and you're also not going to get some. And that's just the odds. Like it's competitive. Sometimes you'll write the greatest grant and for, for no reason it can't get funded because they just don't have enough money. Right. And as a young artist, I always told myself it was because my work was unworthy and that I shouldn't apply again. And this was pointless. And so I didn't for a long time and I failed consistently at writing grants for probably the first 10 years that I wrote grants. I never got any grant. I was, I didn't understand the process at all. Wow. And the only way that I started becoming successful is I got put on a jury. Once I moved to mm. Toronto, I, um, someone told me you, you could apply. I did. I got put on a jury and then mm. I realized like, Oh, this is how yeah. It was the, it was going inside the secret room and going, um, yep. this is whatever. Yeah. And that's doing. what we're trying to do. We're trying to pull back those curtains, you know, pull down those veils. You're frozen a little bit later, but I know you're going to come back. But a lot of this information is like super gatekept and just hide behind like, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, great. They're high. They're hidden behind like really dense and thick walls and curtains. And so the more that we can open that up, the better. Um, and you're right. Going on a jury is like one of the most like instrumental ways, eye opening ways that you can get a better understanding of like what happens behind the scenes. And I know I keep plugging Kevin's video, but he does a lot of information about talking about the point system and how, you know, a, uh, awards are, are often given to these applications and what it looks like to go and read hundreds of applications and what the jury room feels like and the fatigue. And so if you're interested in a little bit of that behind the scenes, Kevin uh, does a really great job of professionally pulling back that veil while still working at a great organization. Um, we only have one question, but it's technically a comment and it just says fantastic webinar, very helpful and detailed explanations. Hope Leah Simone can do another one. Will there be a recording? So there will be a recording. Um, and I will likely put this one up on YouTube. I, I, it's hard to make that decision because I never know like what's going to come up. And sometimes people say sensitive things and we don't want this to be online. But I think the bulk of what's been said here uh, is really great information that will, uh, as Leah Simone says, go viral. So we'll talk about AdSense dollars and how to like <laughs> do this and, and generate <laughs> revenue. I'm going to get the link to Kevin's video as I, I don't know if I've disappeared. I also just minimized this screen. No, I can still see. Amazing. So. Thank you, Aaron. Your comment. Thanks, Aaron. Let's play. So this is a link to Kevin's video. I'm going to put it in the chat so everyone can see. Link to Kevin's video. And then I'm also going to link to the left of center playlist. Left of center playlist. And so, like I mentioned, um, we talked to six artists, or I should say seven, um, and we just explore everything from, you know, how to generate press for your projects. Oh my God, it's playing in the background. God help me. 
technical difficulties. I'm sure everyone can hear this right now. It's so awkward. But um, how to you know generate press? How to create a strong like artist statement? How to do a studio visit online? Um, how to write an artist bio? Like so many things, websites. There's just kind of everything under the sun because we have this like you know really strong understanding of uh, the needs of uh, Black artists and emerging Black artists. Someone says they can't see the link. Make sure I sent it properly. Can you see the link, Leah Simone? Uh, in the chat. Yes, it's in the chat. It's not in the Q and A. Yes, it won't be in the Q and A. I can put them in the Q and A. Maybe that's a good idea. Let's type this answer. And, you know, this is also a great opportunity for me to plug Nia Center's social media. If any of these links uh, aren't working for you or you can't find them or you're watching a recording and you don't have access to the chat, at Nia Center, N-I-A-C-E-N-T-R-E on uh, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and then on Facebook, we're just Nia Center for the Arts, LinkedIn as well. And so all of our amazing content can be found there. You can also check us out online, niacenter.org. I'll just put our website here. But I think what I'll um, also do is there's a little follow-up email that Zoom likes to send after these things, and I'll include all this in the follow-up mm. email so that you guys can get um, you know, all these links in one cohesive place. Um, I don't see any more questions besides uh, lovely comments and, and thanks. So I'm so appreciative for you guys being here. I think comments really like make these sessions. Like you never know what questions you're going to get. Um, and so the questions that you folks asked were just amazing. And I think you really helped steer the conversation into a really great place. So thank you, audience members. Thank you, Leah Simone. You gave us a really great thesis you, at Dom. the end. Do you want to put your um, contact details in the chat as well if people want to sure. yeah. follow you and your amazing yeah. work? The podcast is phenomenal. Can I just Thank say? you. I'm at Leah Simone Bowen on Twitter. And I've just added all the other portals, so you can find me there. Got it. Yeah. The hardest part of me uh, on these sessions is saying goodbye. It's like so final. I just click end and then I know I it's over. Okay. I know. Usually there'd be like a cool lobby and we could talk and drink like water and like whatever and have fun. But I hope everyone takes care. I know it's really unfortunate and rough times that we're going through. But if you are an emerging uh, black artist uh, or an artist in general or just a community member, Nia Center is certainly here to help and, and support you in this transition. We've got a lot of great resources and videos and music and content. So you know, come find us on Instagram, come have fun on our little corner of the internet, and we'll do our best to do more sessions with Leah Simone, because like, you know, God's gift to like Zoom panelists, so thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care See you. Yourselves.